Good afternoon and welcome to today's Stanford Energy Seminar, Precourt uh, Stanford Energy Seminar. Uh, today we have a real treat. Our speaker today is uh, Dr. Joseph B. Powell, um, uh, who is a fellow and former director of the American Institute of Chemical uh, Engineers and uh, served importantly as Shell's first chief science uh, of chemical engineering from 2006 until 2020. Uh, he's basically been in the uh, energy technology and strategy game for a uh, long time, uh, 36 years, it says in his CV, and has won all the awards, not just some of the awards, uh, has been recognized uh, all over, has run National Academy Advisory Councils, DOE Advisory Councils, and now he just told us a, uh, a sustainability, a business sustainability uh, council most recently. Maybe he'll say something about that. So in short, uh, he is uh, one of the uh, most admired, trusted, and respected uh, true experts on energy technology and strategy. He's a veritable uh, superstar. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Joe to uh, give today's seminar, which is on hydrogen's role in achieving net zero carbon emissions for the global economy, a goal that uh, is widely shared by almost everybody at uh, this juncture. So Joe, take it away. It's really great to be here uh, this afternoon, evening, and uh, presenting on one of my uh, favorite topics and something of uh, critical importance to, uh, to future energy. So the talk today is hydrogen's role in achieving net zero carbon emissions for the global economy. And again, again, my name is Joe Powell. I'm retired Shell chief scientist, chemical engineering, and uh, now uh, an industry and uh, energy systems advisor. The agenda today is we'll talk about uh, electrification. So it's really gonna be key to a future low carbon clean energy economy and where will hydrogen complement that and what the alternatives may be. So any cost information that I'll be sharing is derived from the open literature and data and please don't take any observations or things I say as investment advice. So hydrogen. It's the most abundant element in the universe, 75% of the mass and 90% of the atoms. And it's a source of uh, primary energy on the sun, but on the earth, it's always combined with other elements. And so uh, we don't have hydrogen as a primary energy source, but uh, derive hydrogen from the sources we have on, uh, on the earth as an energy vector. It forms flammable mixtures with air and has a very light molecular weight. So it's extremely buoyant. It has a good energy density, more than three times on a mass basis than gasoline or diesel, uh, but a little bit less so on a volume basis and a very low boiling point. So minus 253 degrees C, 20 degrees Kelvin. And that's quite a bit colder than uh, liquefied natural gas. So let's uh, talk about global energy demand. And you're looking here at uh, energy sources since the 1800s. You see traditional uh, woody biomass, coal, oil, gas, and then moving into nuclear and renewables as these uh, slivers of the energy system up here at the top portion of the graph. And what should scare you about this is uh, what we're proposing going forward is to expand the energy system by about 30% to meet global demand, but then also bringing in a lot more of these uh, renewables so that we can reduce our carbon footprints. But to date, uh, renewables have not been storable in any reasonable manner. And so you, if you look at our storable energy systems, namely wood, coal, and oil, and to some degree, gas has storage in the energy systems and pipeline, then that's a real challenge. So if we're gonna meet uh, future energy with clean energy, we have to almost have two systems, one being a, a dispatchable set of energy and then the other are uh, renewables, which we're having a difficulty in storing. And so that's a tremendous transformation of, of technology that has to occur. And we're talking about doing this in something that's uh, capturing uh, the width of the words here on the right-hand side of the axis. So it's an incredible rate of change in the energy systems technology to have uh, that much energy to switch to uh, the renewables, but then also have 
dispatchable power from uh, the things that we can store, which we saw the issues with that uh, about three weeks ago here in Texas in terms of the, the difficulty in dealing with the ups and downs of scenarios. Now that was not really a black swan scenario that, that Texas endured. We had had uh, long snaps of, of cold weather in the past. People tend to forget that and not plan them into their energy systems. And so one of the really important roles that hydrogen can play is to provide uh, clean and dispatchable storage coming off of renewable energy. Uh, alternatives to that are to either design systems that can do without energy for periods of time, which is quite difficult to do, or retain the uh, dispatchable powers coming, uh, uh, power sources coming off of coal, oil, and gas, and uh, traditional biomass, which also has its uh, issues in terms of the amount of total energy producing capacity that we have to develop. So hydrogen can play a very key role in terms of the ability to store energy for uh, uh, systems of interruptions to our uh, clean and renewable energy supplies. So many of you are in California today and uh, the duck curve should be nothing new to you. And, uh, but that's essentially the daily uh, cycle in uh, energy demand and uh, switching from renewables to dispatchable power. And that's actually a relatively easy problem relative to the issue of dealing with longer term energy storage and high uh, energy density demands such as we saw that, that impacted uh, Texas about three weeks ago. So this is a front and center headline news argument today. And uh, what I'd like to do is, is show you where hydrogen may play in, uh, in meeting some of these demands of the energy system. So hydrogen, we've known about it for 500 years. If you look at uh, Jules Verne in 1874, writing Mysterious Island, that was a, a science fiction novel where the world was planted, uh, powered by hydrogen uh, derived from water. Water electrolysis was already, was already known at that time. And so uh, this was a, an evolution of technology. This is an open system. So if you're bringing in renewable energy, you can afford to, uh, to uh, derive it from water, whereas that is the combustion project uh, product from, um, from fossil energy. So uh, early use in airships in the 1800s uh, for making uh, chemicals and such in the early 1900s, rocket fuel in 1943, of course, the Hindenburg fire in 1937, which is, was a dirigible that caught fire, but uh, much of that was really the, uh, the skin uh, membrane that was covering the dirigible and, and not directly related to, to the hydrogen. And then used to power the space program. So Project Gemini, uh, certainly the, the cross synergy in deploying hydrogen uh, using uh, oxygen for the, for the astronauts, plus the, the fuel cells to pro provide the electrical systems, but also in some of the rocketry for some of the missions, uh, that carrying over into the Apollo moon missions. The General Motors Electrovan also there in, in the 1960s, 1966. Uh, and you see here in the 70s, uh, one of the early DOE uh, preliminary uh, vehicles, hydrogen powered vehicle, which uh, no one would purchase, but this was certainly uh, what it was looking like in the experimental modes in the 1970s. And finally in 2000, when uh, Ballard uh, came on with the first commercial fuel cell and President George Bush uh, declared, uh, uh, we're gonna create a hydrogen economy. And so uh, by right about now, uh, those who were born on or around the 2000s would be driving hydrogen powered vehicles according to this uh, initiative. And it didn't quite happen. We made some progress, but uh, not to the extent that was perhaps anticipated. And so you ask why. And the issue with that is uh, two things have to happen for hydrogen to be valuable. One is you have to really care about local air quality and not have other ways of getting there. So we did clean up air and, and reduce emissions in the internal combustion engines. And the other thing that you really need is to care about uh, carbon footprints and, and climate change in a manner where you're really willing to invest in infrastructure and doing something about it. And so that's uh, the precipice which we're perhaps on the, the verge of today. And that's why hydrogen has been uh, developing 
as an entity and, and possible uh, vector for uh, several hundred years and certainly in, in the last 20 or so, and perhaps now is, is uh, positioned and, and, and ready to move forward. So this is a plot uh, from the shell scenarios. You can look at that online. It uh, describes the, the needs to address increasing population, the growing global energy de demand that will uh, result from that increase, uh, but then also the need to address carbon emissions and get to net zero and likely have an overshoot, which means we have to be capturing CO2 out of the atmosphere in, in later years. And most companies have now moved up this notional date of 2070 into the 2050s to 2035-ish range to be net zero. And we're seeing uh, much more initiative behind that amongst uh, stakeholders to date. So it's not just about uh, uh, CO2 and greenhouse gas and climate change, but it's also about air quality. So if you look at what happened during COVID, there were some uh, clean days uh, in terms of visibility in the Bay Area. And some of that had to do with uh, reduced vehicles on the road, reduced knocks and socks and smog. And so that's also attractive across the globe. And, and one of the prime considerations from moving to hydrogen as a vector along with the electrification for, for clean en energy. So the market forces for both of those are, are coming into play and uh, never seen more intensity as what we've seen in the last year and a half or so in terms of interest in, in electrification and in hydrogen. Now here's another picture from the Shell scenarios, which uh, a cartoon that describes the way different components will play into the energy system going forward. So if you look, the uh, deep blue is electrification. The light blue is hydrogen. Uh, we've got red, which could be continuing fossil hydrocarbon fuels, or it could be solar hydrocarbon fuels made from uh, either biofuels or, or via so-called synthetic solar fuels. And each of those will play into different optimal parts of the energy economy. And so the optimization of this puzzle is, is one of been one of my uh, day jobs in, in recent years. And, and certainly one of the things we really have to figure out and get correct in order to, to roll out the, the infrastructure that we need going forward. So Shell just came out with some even newer scenarios uh, as of about two weeks ago. And so again, you can go online. It's a really good read about uh, not just the technology, but also the socio-political uh, underpinnings which will determine what kind of energy systems that we get going into the future. And so in addition to the sky scenario, sky was designed to achieve, uh, what would it take to achieve a two degrees C or less temperature rise uh, back a few years ago? And now we're talking about sky 1.5, which is uh, what would it take to achieve a one and a half degrees C or less temperature rise? but also two bounding scenarios that go with that, one being waves and the other being islands. And so waves considers uh, what happens if the world is in tune to the most robust in investment and economic wealth scenario, where there is a lot of global trade, sharing of technology and optimization of international energy systems. And what you see in waves is the most wealth, the most growth in energy demand uh, because of that, and the most utilization of hydrogen. So hydrogen here is shown in the light green, and you see electrification uh, with renewables in the light blue and, and with uh, non-renewable in the dark blue. Whereas if you go over to the islands, that assumes that uh, nation states are acting with localized self-interests, without as much trade, and with concerns over energy security dominating their policy and energy de decisions. And what you see there is uh, less uh, total energy demand, which one may think is a good thing, but it also means that there's a less wealth uh, across the globe. There's much less use for hydrogen. And uh, in addition, uh, there is a significant play from electrification going forward, but again, continued and, and, and more extensive use of, of uh, fossil fuels in that energy mix as well. So if we uh, look further than that, then uh, this is the median case, the sky 1.5 scenario. 
which says we have good global policy, we have an intermediate amount of hydrogen use, and uh, we electrify. We have continuing use of biofuels and some solar fuels to satisfy the rest of the energy economy. And if you look at what that means for hydrogen, so in the most optimistic scenario, you have a tremendous increase in the amount of energy that's delivered to end users by uh, hydrogen, approaching 180 exajoules a year. Again, the uh, likely scenario with Sky 1.5 is around 70. Uh, but if we don't have the uh, global trade and uh, an optimization across that system and, and have the island scenario, then you see there's, there's almost no increase of, uh, of hydrogen demand about what, what we're seeing uh, today. So that really uh, helps describe uh, the importance of, of uh, policy and optimization. And I'll explain as we go for forward a little bit about why that happens. So here's another uh, recent issue. This is from Bloomberg NEF on the policy impact on hydrogen demand in the US. And you see it goes from a, a theoretical ma maximum to uh, what would be a, uh, a strong policy implementation to a weak policy by 2050 with uh, more than a, uh, a five to seven fold change in, in uh, the demand uh, across that space. So solar energy as a logistic and, uh, and, and energy challenge. So one of the issues that we need to do in the, uh, the optimization across the system is uh, consider where is the overlay of population distributions relative to uh, direct solar insulation. And, uh, and what you find is there is a mismatch between those where those two occur and, uh, and so we need to look at uh, what can we do to move renewable energy over long distances and, and store it uh, as such. So looking at hydrogen as an energy vector, the top left is a uh, plot from Shell showing the places in the world which are strong in uh, renewable energy and, and where we might be moving that energy to uh, over a relatively long distance using hydrogen as a vector. And in the bottom is a similar path from uh, the, uh, the Hydrogen Council, which is describing uh, not only where fossil energy may be moved, but also uh, using clean hydrogen, which may be derived from natural gas reforming and carbon sequestration. So very similar maps. But what you're doing here is you're taking a uh, energy from a, a very rich solar or wind region and then transmitting it to a market where there is less wind or solar intensity. And if you're going to do that, you pay an energy penalty. So you uh, have to be relying on the fact of what that higher intensity may be. And then you have to compete with the option of uh, developing that similar amount of uh, renewable or clean energy at the market or source. And then what is your carrier for doing that? So you can make uh, biofuels or synthetic hydrocarbons, but if you combust them and don't clean up your, your vehicles further, you, you can have continuing atmospheric uh, uh, local air quality issues. Hydrogen, uh, either via combustion or put into the fuel cell is clean burning. So you eliminate that, uh, that issue in terms of the, the hydrogen vehicles. And that needs to be optimized across your energy consistent considerations. So the reason that you uh, can do this is because of the energy density. Uh, it simply would not be feasible to take uh, today's batteries or anything that's uh, going to be developed in the foreseeable future, charging and moving them over tankers long distances and storing them uh, to be moving energy uh, in this magnitude. So there's the energy transport uh, problem, which uh, ties into the uh, uh, sky uh, and uh, waves and winds uh, scenarios. And I would say that there was an energy, uh, uh, there was a problem in the early uh, labelings on the shell slot. So this is off by an order, order of magnitude and then the energy in the exit joules. So we'll have to make that uh, translation. Again, that's hot off the press. So let's uh, go through a case study and example. Uh, we did some systems modeling uh, using uh, uh, 
Professor Stratos Pistacophilus' group at Texas A&M University to look at uh, renewable wind and solar from Texas to provide a portion, let's say 10% of the, the grid power in, in New York City and look at uh, what would the attractiveness of that uh, be. And, uh, and looking at that overall system, we found two things. One is if there is a higher resource intensity in, in Texas versus uh, New York and, and, and Long Island. Uh, the other issue is the land use costs. So land use uh, in, in West Texas in particular is, is much less. And then another factor that comes into the play is by moving this energy in the form of either liquid hydrogen or perhaps ammonia and putting it back into the grid, then you're gaining some storage benefits by so doing by having that infrastructure and systems play coming into play. So that particular scenario says that could look uh, marginally cost uh, effective as a way of uh, moving renewable energy uh, and storing it uh, over long distances. But again, you have to be careful with these because uh, these assessments are quite, quite scenario dependent and, and we need to do much more of this to make uh, good choices uh, globally on our future energy system. Now this chart helps explain a very key aspect of, of what I want to, to talk about today and, and that along with the next one after it. But uh, we have a fundamental change when we're talking about renewable energy in terms of the energy you know, hydrogen is a primary source on the sun for fusion, but it's not on the earth. So we're taking in the energy as photons now, and we can readily convert it to electrons. And that's quite different than uh, taking our input energies as fossil fuels. And so if you look at the, the cost of conversion to energy carriers, and namely the cost of the feed stocks, the, the photons and the electrons are now the cheapest which is very different from the, the power generation of what we had in the past. Hydrogen is, is the simplest thing that you can make, but you can also liquefy it and you can take it into other carriers like ammonia, methanol, or you can actually uh, reform that by capturing CO2 out of the atmosphere, making the methanol and uh, hydrocarbon fuels such as uh, gasoline or diesel via Fischer-Trope synthesis or methanol to gasoline at a higher cost a feedstock and energy penalty, but drop it into the infrastructure that we have today. So the ease of use Im improves, the overall efficiency and use of the renewable energy goes down and the cost of the fuel goes up. So those are the trade-offs we have to consider along this space in terms of which of these carriers do we like the best and what makes the most sense moving forward. Here's another way of looking at it. So again, this time we have photons on the top coming into electrons where you can get very efficient 85% or higher uh, storage and very efficient uh, uses into the uh, energy services, 75% uh, or better. Uh, looking at battery electric vehicles, they have the fewest components. So you're reducing the number of onboard components relative to the in internal combustion engine from something like uh, 3,000 down to 1,000 components. If you go then down to hydrogen, you're taking a bit of a, uh, a, a hit in terms of the overall efficiency of production and the energy services, maybe uh, up to a 50% hit, as I'll show you shortly. And you've got to add a little bit. It's still considered to be an electric drivetrain, but you are uh, essentially adding a fuel cell to that. And, and then getting a, a clean energy system. And you can further go down to using ammonia or again, uh, making these synthetic hydrocarbon fuels like gasoline or diesel, and, uh, and then putting that into an internal combustion engine. Now using CO2 that's captured from the atmosphere. So it is a, a renewable and uh, clean relative to greenhouse gas footprints, but coming at an overall services and efficiency cost. So if we look at what this translates into, uh, uh, this one axis is uh, a unit amount of renewable energy. And if we go to electric drive trains directly, we're at maybe a 75% efficiency in terms of the energy that's uh, delivered to the wheels in a vehicle. If we go to uh, grid-based power, then that may go uh, to around 60%. If we're making uh, today's gasoline or diesel from fossil fuels, we're at about the, the 30, 35% uh, efficiency 
uh, in terms of the source to wheels uh, energy deployment. And that's similar to what we can get with hydrogen coming from renewable energy sources. So it takes about twice as much solar or wind uh, uh, farms and facilities to produce the amount of energy you need to make hydrogen, but it's more storable and uh, can be shipped long distances. So perhaps your intensity may be twice as good in, in, in one region as another. Now, if you further wanted to convert that hydrogen by direct air capture of CO2 into the so-called solar liquid fuels, which would be solar gasoline or diesel, then your efficiency is going down into the 10 or maybe 12 to about 18% or about half the efficiency of the hydrogen. So now this may take about uh, four of those uh, solar farms versus uh, two for hydrogen relative to one that you may need for a similarly uh, intensified, uh, similar intensity on the, uh, on the PV uh, solar side. So that's a very important uh, point when you look at the, the overall energy systems. And uh, this is another uh, uh, diagram that shows the number of components that you need to feed in to make uh, these so-called solar fuels how much land use it may take to supply the gasoline needs in the state of California, which may be uh, more than the amount of undeveloped land for sale. It may be 1.3% of the, the California land mass to do that, and, and some degree of water to go into making of those fuels in, in addition to the, uh, the uh, liquefied uh, solar, gasoline, and diesel. So Shell likes hydrogen because it's, uh, and many others as well, because it's, uh, Crosscut so much of the energy space. You can make it from uh, uh, either natural gas or uh, biogas or biomethane. So reforming of any type of hydrocarbon, but also from any source of uh, power electricity via water electrolysis. And so it crosscuts across many pieces of the, the energy system. It does take uh, quite a bit from production to get it uh, compressed, uh, transmitted, stored and dispensed. And so uh, you can't underestimate the energy costs uh, and infrastructure costs that go into making that happen. The big play for hydrogen, uh, you see some heavy industry and light industry use, but uh, quite a bit on the transportation side, and, uh, but mostly on the heavy duty side. Uh, if you look at uh, how much of the light duty vehicles may electrify, that may be relatively low relative to battery vehicles, but uh, more in the heavy duty side of the equation. So the DOE looks at uh, a program called Hydrogen at Scale. And what's that tr trying to do is to integrate the different uses from hydrogen across sectors from transportation to, uh, to heavy industry and also residential heat and power. And by integrating the total amount produced in, in, in demand, you can get the cost down. And by so doing, uh, can look at a, uh, you know, six to seven, maybe even a tenfold increase in the amount of hydrogen production today or not. Again, depending upon, that's the potential, but whether or not these uh, transport systems are uh, uh, developed into policy and, 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 and really uh, identified to be as, as useful as they seem to be in optimal solution of that energy systems problem. So other uh, countries around the globe are, are making similar uh, uh, roadmaps along with global organizations. So here's the International Partnership for Hydrogen, seeing also a, a 8% or a 7 to uh, 10 fold uh, growth. Uh, the hydrogen roadmap for Europe, seeing a similar 7 to 8 fold growth uh, as a potential for where hydrogen can be. And if we look as an archetype on hydrogen production in the US Gulf Coast, so again, we're looking at integrating across the, the petrochemical sector there. We can bring in uh, abundant natural gas and reform it and uh, do carbon capture and sequestration, which is easy to do in Texas and the Gulf Coast, or we can bring in renewables as well. And then we can market that into the low, low carbon fuel standards in California, or as we mentioned, uh, shipping it to New York or uh, as liquid hydrogen or, or ammonia, shipping it to Japan and other locations as a, uh, as a, pop, uh, as a possible destination where there's policy in place. And then also consider all of that industry in, in the Texas area, which has commitments to decarbonization. So that's something that's actively being looked at. You see a lot of the hydrogen deployments that are talked about 
as being port rollouts. And the reason for that is the amount of uh, commerce and uh, heavy mobility that comes into play in the port. So you see the port of Long Beach and LA are uh, two of the largest in the, the US in terms of the drayage trucks and the transport that, that's coming out of there. And then all of the other components that go into those uh, 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 plays, economic plays that come in those harbor uh, goods and transport situations that can uh, add to the total demand and by so doing uh, reduce the total amount of infrastructure that needs to be put into play for uh, high rollouts of, of a hydrogen economy from these locations. So many places around the world are looking at those rollouts. Here's one for the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, which is looking at uh, offshore wind, but also bringing in natural gas. And so sharing a hydrogen distribution pipeline, but then also a uh, CO2 pipeline for carbon capture and storage for uh, storage uh, offshore in, in the North Sea. And so you're looking at these integrated systems plays where you can uh, uh, combine uh, clean energy plays where hydrogen is, is one of the vectors and uh, carbon and capture and storage being the other uh, with both the renewable and uh, blue hydrogen as, as part of that play. Blue hydrogen meaning that which is reformed from uh, natural gas. And then that can be sourced also into uh, Germany uh, to supply some of those, uh, their uh, mobility needs. Now here's a, uh, a map showing uh, the hydrogen council. And again, that uh, eight or eight so or four, eight, eightfold or so growth in, uh, in the hydrogen demand. And uh, also looking then at uh, what's happening in, uh, in the UK. So I was on a uh, conference panel uh, last week where the UK believes that uh, electrification, the grid uh, can't be electrified to the extent to satisfy the energy density demands of, uh, of their overall energy system. And they really see uh, hydrogen as a very key component because of the ability to install uh, pipelines for transport. They have some older town gas pipelines and, and so perhaps can retrofit these pipelines more readily than, than some of the other places in the world can. But they really see uh, uh, the pipelines as a major component in terms of being able to roll out uh, uh, clean energy in, in a bit, big way with concerns about whether the grid rollout would be able to support uh, the amount of energy that will be required. And so that's a, a choice and consideration that has to be made in many places in the world. If you look at this uh, set of charts from the International Energy Agency on the future of hydrogen, on the right-hand side, we see what is the cost that hydrogen can afford into the marketplace uh, to be used across the varying markets. And it's already used today as, a, as an industry feedstock, so it can command a high price. Uh, and as you work uh, along the right-hand side here, you can see trucks and cars are, are two of the, uh, the more premium uh, energy spaces and uh, other things along uh, steel production and industrial heat and power are a bit more challenged uh, in terms of the price that can be uh, commanded. Uh, if you look at things like commercial fleets, then hydrogen has advantages in rapid refueling. And so you can consider uh, fuel cell taxis competing with internal combustion engines and uh, maybe battery uh, electric because of that uh, fast refueling and high uptimes that, that can come with hydrogen. So again, here's another way of looking that, uh, at that chart from uh, Blue Bloomberg New Energy. And uh, what, uh, what sectors, uh, what's the cost of abatement for a given sector? And again, the mobility sector, uh, the way it's moving can almost be uh, cost competitive uh, today without uh, adding costs on CO2 in order to incentivize. We'll get into more of that shortly. Uh, the rest of the, uh, the decarbonization needs a bit of, of a carbon incentive factor. So if we look at uh, uh, what sectors are really uh, contributing most to the greenhouse gas emissions. So in the US, transport is about 28% and globally it may be about 14%. And if we look at the US transport, 59% of the, that is light duty vehicles, but the medium and heavy duty is still a significant uh, percentage of that, 23% of that uh, total uh, of 28% of, of the US greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a big target there 
in terms of uh, decarbonizing uh, heavier duty mobility. Now, this is a, uh, a, uh, a chart from uh, Sunita Satyapal, who uh, I work with uh, on the Hydrogen Advisory Council for the DOE, uh, continually being updated. And it really shows the uh, fuel cell deployments, uh, mostly in, in California, where most of this has been rolled out to, to date in the US. And now this Toyota Mirai is quite a big improvement over that uh, prototype uh, DOE vehicle I showed you earlier from the 1970s. So this is now, I, I actually drove one of those in Pittsburgh last year. It's a, it's a legitimate vehicle and, uh, and uh, certainly a competitive player in the light duty space. But the real amazing story is, uh, is uh, the forklifts and uh, Andy Marsh and Plug Power. So uh, being one of the key players there but uh, forklifts uh, were rolled out with, uh, moved away from diesel and, and initially to battery electric because of the indoor air quality and, and working in these facilities. But it was really overtaken by hydrogen. And the reason for that was the, the faster refueling time. So that saved about 10% of the number of forklifts put a, plus a lot of labor that was involved in the refueling. And on its own economic and merits alone, it's now, uh, Primarily the way you were getting uh, packages all during this lockdown via warehouses at Amazon, Home Depot, and, uh, and Walmart, et cetera. So uh, really a great success story in, in meeting a market need and, uh, and delivering uh, cost and reliability. When you look going forward, the cost of making hydrogen from uh, renewables, uh, it's more expensive today uh, mainly because of the electrolyzer costs. But uh, by 2030, this is projected to be coming down in price so that uh, that cost is going to be competitive with what we can do from natural gas uh, reforming by 2030 and beyond. And so you can think of $1 a, a kilogram hydrogen is $1 a gasoline equivalent in terms of energy. So it's uh, a kilogram is, is, is a gallon uh, equivalent energy and, uh, and so by 2030 or so, uh, hydrogen can be uh, competitive in terms of the cost of being made from renewables as, as what uh, would come from uh, current uh, reforming of, uh, of natural gas. Now, this is a, a chart from the IEA showing uh, how that varies uh, today uh, in terms of the gray, the pricing across the globe. But again, uh, by 2030, the uh, electrolysis is, is going to be uh, very competitive in that space. And that's really influencing some of the uh, decision-making around rollouts. The value of the hydrogen also depends on the use. So if you're just burning it, there's no uh, great efficiency improvement. But if you're using it in a fuel cell, then you're avoiding the Carnot inefficiency and you're actually getting more use out of that in terms of the energy than just putting it into a heat engine. So that has to be taken into play and in, in, in considering the total value proposition of hydrogen. And then also the amount of infrastructure. So this is H2 Mobility Europe on the right hand side, looking at the amount of infrastructure needed if you're going to go out hydrogen in a big way. And namely, a major portion of the economy is now coming from clean or renewables. And if you electrify, it's easy to electrify early on. And hydrogen infrastructure uh, uh, takes more uh, unit investment in order to get up and running. But as you go to high degrees of penetration, it may actually take less via those hydrogen pipelines and et cetera. So the different uh, companies involved in transport are looking at this in different ways. So the top left is, uh, is Volkswagen talking about, uh, well, for light duty, they're really uh, looking at the electrification because of this efficiency issue. Uh, again, from source to wheels of 76% uh, efficiency versus 30% for hydrogen. So that works well for, for the light duty and has become their focus. If you look at the uh, heavy duty mobility, so Scania in Sweden is saying uh, they're gonna electrify the trucks now. They've, they've looked at both the hydrogen and, the, and electrification. Uh, if you look at GM and Navistar, they're staying with the hydrogen trucks. The hydrogen council is pointing out that uh, Further developments in the hydrogen fuel cell vehicle can make them more competitive than electric uh, by the 2030 plus time frame. So you're seeing a lot of different scenarios come out there in terms of the assumptions and, and, and what can happen. 
Certainly today uh, with the incentives, there, there are good incentives for electrification of the light duty fleets and the, the uh, Mirai fuel cell will have a difficult time uh, competing uh, with some of the options uh, in, in the light duty space there. Again, uh, more studies of what's called this total cost of ownership for the hydrogen economy. So the, uh, the US roadmap would say fuel cells may be competitive on a total cost of ownership in the US with the internal combustion engines in the 2030-2035 type uh, time frame. And again, uh, another study from uh, Bloomberg that says, well, maybe that'll be close to equal by, by the 2030 timeframe. So you see different sets of numbers coming out depending upon uh, the exact details of the scenarios in terms of how that will play out. What everyone does say is that the costs today for hydrogen are high because of uh, small amounts of rollout and infrastructure and high unit prices for hydrogen because of that. Again, uh, more total cost of energy, uh, ownership plots from the IEA future of hydrogen. And a lot of that uh, really is dependent upon uh, what are the battery prices going forward into the future and also what are the uh, electrolyzer costs in terms of making the hydrogen, but also fuel cell on the fuel cell side. So the technology evolution pathways will in part determine what is uh, competitive in uh, 2030 uh, versus uh, what we're seeing today. And it's a difficult thing uh, to tell. But again, looking at the heavier duty markets where you've got the, the higher power density that's required, uh, uh, many are saying that the hydrogen fuel cell and the, the trucking and heavy duty mobility are gonna be more cost effective uh, as we move into 2030 and beyond. But hydrogen gets squeezed. And so you see uh, in terms of operation time and power density, uh, the smaller vehicles can be electrified, although you may want to electrify that forklift if you want to have a commercial fleet and, and charge it quickly. You've got your hydrogen uh, fuel cell space in the middle. And then uh, when it comes to the larger jet airliners and some of these uh, longer distance mobility and higher power, higher power density plays, such as a mining truck or something like that, then you may need uh, the synthetic or solar liquid hydrocarbon fuels for that type of power density. So I would say that uh, hydrogen is a bit squeezed by uh, electrification on the, the light duty side to uh, the solar fuels and biofuels on the, the very heavy duty side and uh, a playing ground in, in the middle. And it'll be interesting to see how this, that translates out. So here's a Airbus uh, photo on hydrogen for aviation. And uh, given uh, where you have to store and the slightly lower volumetric energy density for the hydrogen. It, it's a big fuselage with hydrogen. It can't be put into the wings and it has range impacts for some of the planes that are being developed. So again, you may need the biofuels on the heavy end of the space there. Uh, looking at what happens in terms of the migration towards cities and heavy industry and the need for power density versus the intrinsic energy density and power density coming in in terms of the renewable systems. We've got a mismatch there. And so you either need much more land to source the energy we need going forward as a civilization, or we need to be able to source that from afar and, and make these higher energy density carriers. And so that's really an issue that has to be worked going forward in the energy system. And a lot of the land right around uh, developing cities is, is high priced and uh, not so amenable to large uh, wind and solar farms. And so that issue really has to be considered in terms of uh, how much do we want to rely on grid electrification and how much energy do we need to be moving in from afar in order to make this work. If you see on the top right here, we're talking about uh, a plot on uh, grid storage uh, options and uh, and quite a bit this being in the battery space in terms of, of, of what that storage supply would mean for outages. And so if you look at solar uh, purchase uh, price agreements at uh, three cents a kilowatt hour, you can make a, a dollar a kilogram uh, hydrogen on that in, in, in the future, which is the equivalent of a, a, dollar, a, gas, a, gal, uh, a dollar a gallon gasoline uh, in that future cost with the, the reduction in electrolyzer price. And so that's very compelling. 
but that doesn't include any storage. And if you look at what we can do in, in batteries for storage, it's, it's very challenged uh, on a, uh, a large scale and for the large type of systems energy required to do that for, for more than the one hour to, to maybe four hours. And, and the storage costs are just enormous looking at those scenarios. And so that's where hydrogen can come into play, even though, again, you're taking a factor of a two efficiency and making it as a carrier versus storing it in a battery. So after the great blackout in Texas, I looked at, uh, well, what would it take to convert my home to uh, uh, residential storage? Because I can't count on the grid. And that's five days outage. It was not a black swan event. We've had uh, three of those in my lifetime. Uh, the only black swan we had was the 60 inches of rain we got during Hurricane Hardy, which was a true outlier. But uh, people tend to envision uh, black swans as things that happen every 10 years and, uh, and sort of have a, a weak memory for, for, for the events. I think the data really shows that if, if you really do the data analytics on, on the history of renewable energy. But the, the bottom line on this one is the, the hydrogen battery uh, just coming into play in terms of what one can purchase is, is $30,000 for three days storage to keep the house running so that I'm not losing uh, uh, power and having the pipes break. The Tesla power wall is about 24,000 and the natural gas generators are running uh, quite a bit less than that. So uh, as a final, uh, Introduction also looked at, well, what would it take to decarbonize uh, the largest truck stop in the world, which is in Walcott, Iowa, and, uh, and move that away from diesel to uh, renewable energy and considering uh, both uh, battery electric and or hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, how much land use is required, and then what are the implications for a five-day outage? Again, you can't count on solar and wind all the time over 10 year periods is being present. And you either have to be able to re-engineer your systems to deal with five days of outage, or you have to provide storage. Uh, and then what would it take uh, to be able to do that? And, and uh, the bottom line is uh, the land use looks reasonable, uh, perhaps borderline if, if ethanol is used as a biofuel in, in that play, but uh, wind and solar certainly take a lot less land use. It's twice as much for hydrogen, but you have the ability to provide the, uh, the hydrogen storage. And if you care about being able to, to keep those trucks up and running over that five day period and also deal with some of the day night, then, uh, then hydrogen certainly makes a lot of sense in that space. So where are things playing? Uh, the hydrogen economy is really rolling out in Europe and China because of the, the high energy prices there and the, and the policy. And uh, I guess I'll be, uh, uh, this slide just points out what those energy price differentials are in different parts of the world and uh, relative to natural gas in the United States and Canada. And that comes into play in terms of where you're deciding to, to move renewable energy and uh, where the alternative is and, and how much of incentive do you need to be able to switch from uh, uh, carbon producing fuels to, to low carbon. Safety is another key consideration. So we uh, stood up the Center for Hydrogen Safety with AICHE, a uh, global institute to address the rollout of the hydrogen economy, which is also very important for stakeholders. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, certainly the, the world will electrify and, uh, and that's a given for decarbonization. Uh, if you don't care about storage and can be without energy for very long periods of time, then uh, perhaps you can work around some of these uh, high energy, energy density systems and figure out how to do that with, with batteries and, and that type of power density. That's gonna be a bit of a challenge. But if you really wanna integrate storage into that energy system, then uh, you either need uh, hydrogen at maybe uh, twice of the amount of land use that, that you had with uh, uh, just the battery storage and, and the battery electric, or you have to go to the synthetic fuels, which will re require four times that amount of space uh, and higher cost fuels and, and can use existing infrastructure. So with that, uh, I will conclude my talk. I've given my uh, contact information on the bottom left there and uh, be happy to uh, address questions or uh, I guess we have a follow-up session yeah. after this one to, to yeah, let's that. Yeah, uh, sure. Joe, if you, if you don't mind, let's do some a few open questions because we got quite a few, and then uh, that'll lead into the uh, uh, 
student re registered student uh, session. That was absolutely terrific as evidenced by the large number of viewers and the large number of questions. I'm now looking at 42 open questions, which I think might be a new. Well, let me start with the salt cabins. So that's a great question. And anywhere you've got salt cabins, you've got very low cost hydrogen storage. And the big problem is you don't have them everywhere. So we've got them on the Gulf Coast. You don't have them in California, maybe a few in Europe, but, but that's a really good one in terms of an option for low hydrogen storage cost. But uh, uh, so but yeah, certainly, uh, not ubiquitous. Go ahead, John. So that was a theme. Uh, uh, one that came up over and over again from different perspectives was people were intrigued by the idea of using existing uh, uh, transmission and dis distribution ca uh, capacity, namely existing natural gas pipelines. How far can you go with that? And how far do you recommend that uh, we think about going? Yeah, I've got a plot for the class lecture. In some places, uh, you can blend up to 30% into the, the pipelines and, uh, and then maybe consider fishing the, the hydrogen out of a mixture, which is a challenge. And, uh, but in many places, the, the blend ratio is going to be well below 10% uh, and maybe uh, 3%. And so there are issues with the welds. And there's also, in terms of retrofitting, some of the, the polymeric piping and, and, and lining. And so that's another whole lecture, but uh, my impression is that there's going to be quite a lot of new infrastructure and the amount of retrofitting and, and burner, uh, certainly the burner replacements can be done, but the, but the retrofitting is, is going to be uh, partially doable for a blend, difficult for 100% hydrogen, and we're going to require uh, a lot of infrastructure investment if we're going to go into a, a truly clean hydrogen uh, as, a, as, as a vector. Well, combine a couple of different themes. There, there is a, uh, some concern probably related to how you transport about the uh, smallness of the hydrogen molecules leading to more leaks. So the question is, is that, is that a problem in terms of explosions or affecting atmospheric chemistry? And a more general question is, is there an issue going back to Hindenburg, I guess, uh, about public health and safety that might impede public acceptance? I know you probably thought about this more than anybody. Yeah, well, it's not toxic, and uh, the uh, high atmosphere environmental uh, and, and greenhouse issues are, are considered very low uh, with the best science that I'm aware of today. So uh, the issue really is the, uh, the flammability. Uh, the interesting thing about hydrogen is it snakes up directly. It's extremely buoyant, and so uh, when some of the fire marshals are, are looking at the uh, the uh, automobile wreck scenarios and the, the hydrogen is going straight up. And, and in some cases, it, it's safer than, uh, than a liquid fuel pool fire. So I think po people are getting comfortable with that. Uh, certainly one needs to, to stay on guard from it. And that's really why we rolled out the Center for Hydrogen Safety is to get the experience out there in terms of using and, and, and working with it. I think the yellow flame on the Hindenburg was really the polymeric uh, skin on the uh, um, on the uh, dirigible itself that uh, was a, a large part of the issue. But uh, so certainly uh, we believe it can be handled and uh, but uh, safety uh, certainly cannot be, uh, uh, has to be very rigorously addressed and we have to have a very safe rollout to get stakeholder acceptance. Another big picture thing, probably just recognizing your long uh, experience both at the top of the private sector and public sector is, from your point of view, uh, how would you, uh, who should decide how fast to go with either electrification or hydrification? Um, put put differently, what kind of what kind of uh, public partner pri pri uh, partnership would you recommend? What should the role of governments do? What should the role of the private sector do? Philanthropy, you know, international organizations and whatnot. That's quite a loaded question. So uh, you see different approaches around the world, depending upon uh, you know how people like to organize their uh, uh, political systems. Okay, just and, pick, uh, pick U.S. then. <laughs> so in the U.S., uh, I think we're in a bit of a transition, but uh, we see a lot of policy in California. Uh, we see some emerging acceptance in the rest of the country, but I think we're lagging because we don't have more centralized uh, decision making. And, and you see where it is a bit more centralized and they make uh, perhaps more uh, strategic investment decision, decisions, but also uh, in places like Europe, uh, Japan, you know, they also have those higher energy prices that go with that. And so it's a little bit less of a, of a trade-off to be addressed. 
And so I really see a hodgepodge of that going forward. And, and, and that's what really makes it exciting because we're gonna see quite a number of these different types of uh, energy systems roll out and, and be optimized in, 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 varying, in, in various places. But uh, certainly the incentives are there in, in, in California, the industry commitments are there uh, to be decarbonizing. And uh, if we're looking at transporting hydrogen uh, from Texas to California, uh, we could also look at decarbonizing the route along that transport and, 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 and starting to get some uh, long range uh, transit uh, decarbonization along I-10, I-20 type roadways and et cetera. Yeah, so we're now up to 52 questions and uh, everybody wants your data and your uh, charts and your references. You probably get a lot so of it. The, so. the CO2 through electrolysis, I would say uh, usually electrolysis, uh, you capture CO2 coming off of uh, methane uh, steam reforming and then electrolysis uh, is, is uh, coming at it from renewable energy and water. And although there are some uh, ways you can incorporate uh, CO2 into uh, uh, capture systems that uh, uh, are, are looking interesting from a fuel cell point of view. That might be a whole other talk. I, I think people are, are di on all sides, maybe dying in that one last question if I can impose on you a little bit is there is this uh, emerging debate between, uh, as you put it, the uh, green and blue hydrogen. It sounds like you have a, a, probably the most balanced view of that whole field. Uh, how do you think about that in terms of what would be, you know, good, desirable, useful, economic, equitable, and whatnot? Well, I believe clean is clean. And uh, I do know that uh, some stakeholders like uh, Microsoft really need the green energy for their uh, data center storage and uh, understand that. And so I think uh, those in the industry need to be playing into the stakeholder needs uh, that are out there. And, uh, but I would hope we could also look at a, a, as an optimization problem and uh, be green where it makes the most sense in terms of uh, uh, further off grid and, and the infrastructure required to connect and, and where those integrations go. Still use the, the so-called blue or the, uh, the uh, hydrogen coming off of uh, uh, natural gas reforming via to steam methane or, or AT, uh, autothermal reforming or, or gasification and really optimize the system because I believe at the end of the day, there's only a certain amount of time, energy and infrastructure investment to go around. And if we make the most efficient choices around the globe, we're gonna be doing the best uh, job of decarbonizing because it takes uh, not only money and resources, but also time to deploy this. So we, we really need to look at it and decide which is best where and uh, and, and do all of the above. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank you for a terrific seminar. It was so uh, full of facts and insights, uh, truly uh, an amazing performance and I think inspiring to all of us. We'll have to check the record books, but I think just on Zoom, this is kind of our all time record without even co considering the live streamers. So I think people were aware of uh, what you might present even before you presented and, and it seemed quite uh, pleased with what you said. So I hope you're able to follow up with a few folks for them. And for me, I, I do think by the end, you had actually in your later slides answered a lot of the previous uh, uh, questions. There's still a, little, a few out there. But Perhaps I think so. Covered. I think the kilowatt hour battery was maybe uh, assuming a 150 by 2030 versus a 650 or so today. I don't know if I get these uh, like I would get on MS Teams with a set of questions people would like me to feedback on or if you would uh, can capture those, I'll be happy to try. Yeah, to what do we that. might uh, do is I think our uh, Zoom uh, guru, Justin, can uh, actually gets this transcript of uh, questions so we could actually forward those to you if you would like. Yeah, I can do that, and then perhaps you can post those, and I'll try to yeah, uh, got it, uh, got it. Uh, yeah. fill in the the answers to to those that I didn't have time. I Thank apologize you. for going a bit uh, long today. Oh, uh, yeah, and, but uh, well worthwhile. There's just so much in there, something for everybody. It was just a, a amazing seminar. So thank you again. Please come visit us when we're able to travel. Again, I'm sure our local group that's trying to uh, uh, spin up a hydrogen initiative would love to talk to you further. Uh, uh, it was uh, truly an outstanding seminar. Thank you so much, Joe. And we'll now transition you into the student portion of the program. All righty. Well, thank you, John. And it's always a privilege to be involved and I look forward to further interaction. So thank you. Great. Thank you, sir.